chronic pain and poor sleep are sadly intertwined breaking the cycle of dependence on pain medication requires a sensitive approach from a knowledgeable space in today's episode we answer three key questions how does pain and sleep influence each other how and why should we move beyond pain killers to holistic approaches to pain what is the holistic approach to pain and sleep there was no one better to tackle this topic than dr deepak ravindran dr deepak ravindran has over 20 years of experience in helping people overcome their pain in the nhs and private practice he is one of the few consultants in the uk who possesses triple certification in lifestyle medicine musculoskeletal medicine and pain medicine he has been a consultant in pain medication since 2010 in one of the biggest district general medical hospital the royal berkshire nhs foundation trust in the uk he is currently the clinical lead for the specialist pain services for all of west berkshire since 2015 He is the author of the pain-free mindset. Let's get started. Hey everyone, I'm the Paralight Functional Medicine practitioner, author and yogini, and you're listening to the Sleep Whisperer podcast, the only sleep podcast with conversations and meditations. I'm on a mission to share profoundly insightful sleep conversations with global visionaries that merge together functional medicine and ancient wisdom. Breathe in bliss through weekly guided meditations and let yourself enter the land of dreams. Together, let's unravel the pieces, get to the roots and understand the right tools to transform your sleep completely. Through this podcast I want you to dream the best version of yourself. It's time to regain hope and begin your sleep journey. Dr. Deepak Ravindran welcome to the Sleep Whisperer podcast. Today we are talking about pain and sleep and I've listened to a lot of your videos in the last few days and um it's always it's, i think the world needs more mbs who are talking about holistic approaches to uh, aspects especially such as pain because it's so easy to fall into a loop of pain killers and i do want to talk a little bit about that as well today and i came across a lot of bidirectional um, relationship between pain and sleep when i was writing my book and how each can impact the other so i'd like for us to start to uh, talking about this bidirectional axis and why do they influence each other but maybe just a quick intro into deepak absolutely uh, deepak well thank you for having me on your podcast and and I must say I feel uh, good to be in the company and the guests that you've had before so thank you for having me on and for reaching out to probably another part of the indian audience that I've been always keen to reach out especially with as you said you know an md giving a more integrative holistic uh, lifestyle medicine based message because i think as far as my specialism and sort of my expertise comes in pain management i have found that to be probably the most important aspect of care that we need to bring to our patients um it's been a sort of a long circuitous journey for me to find myself sitting in your seat uh, today it's been about uh, uh, 20 years or over 20 years of uh, clinical practice i trained actually in india in uh, jipmer pondicherry is where i did my undergraduate medicine i also did my post graduation in uh, anesthesia and pain management and critical care uh, in india in pondicherry and then i came to the uk in 2003 to get my royal college of exam and at that time i thought okay i'll do royal college of exam maybe do a little bit of an extra fellowship or something and then come back to india was 
an initial thought process. Uh, but while doing it, I really found myself more fascinated with pain management. There was a lot of new research that was starting to come out at the turn of the century. Uh, we had this uh, newer form of MRI scanning, which was called functional MRI scanning, which was starting to show how the signaling was being processed by the nervous system. And that meant that a lot of what we studied in our medical schools, what was being taught to various healthcare professionals, not just doctors, but nurses, physios, allied health professionals about what pain is and how pain is perceived and how pain is processed. Everything really has to be almost uh, literally thrown out of the window and we have to start afresh because the discoveries and the understandings that were coming in the last 15 years were very much against what medicine has been taught for the last 300, 400 years. It's a, so for lack of a better word, it is a change from the reductionist biomedical model to a better biological and a more scientific understanding of what we call the biopsychosocial model. You know, that we always, uh, from 1980s, we realized that we have to manage pain by using behavioral therapy approaches, or we have to manage pain by getting more exercise and physio and maybe paying attention to social aspects. But now in the last 15 years, we now have the scientific understanding and actual visible uh, structures that we can say are responsible for processing pain in such a way that the biopsychosocial makes a difference. And that means now we are actually having to ask what else can implicate. And you find that there are a whole lot of integrative approaches that can be done and they achieve the same outcomes sometimes like medications or injections or surgery can do with less side effects, more cheaper, more economical, more quality of life provision. And that has been my mission for the last six, seven years is once I've kind of gained that knowledge, I've thought, well, how do I go about spreading this message? And the book, which got released in 2021 called The Pain-Free Mindset was one attempt at sort of using a book approach. But then I've also realized that I need to be doing more talks and, and appearing on sort of podcast uh, sort of providers and presenters like yourself to actually say we need to think about pain differently and we now know enough to provide a holistic integrated approach to pain management that can be done by a lot of people. We do not have to be necessarily worried. And yes, pain is complex, but it also means we all have a place to start somewhere with an aim to improving our quality of life, hopefully with a lot less pain than we started out with. That was beautiful, Deepak. And I think there are so many things I got from what you said. And I'm really glad as again, just to clarify, because much of the world tends to want such information from MD. So I think it's really important that this aspect is there where you're saying I want to go out and educate on this because sometimes others who are not MDs, when we are talking about information such as more holistic approaches, maybe there might be an iota of questioning in that in terms of credentials. So I'm super glad that you're here talking about this. And just to clarify, before we jump into sleep and pain, uh, when we're talking about pain, could you just describe a little bit about at what point does it become something that we have to really bring attention to? Because we're obviously talking about chronic situations versus just some one single isolated. So could you just clarify what could we say is pain? Absolutely. Absolutely, Deepa. And I think maybe in, in line with maybe with what you mentioned about credentials, I for your listeners, I'll also just uh, clarify as well uh, that I think it is important, you're absolutely right, that there needs to be that expertise in talking about pain. And uh, I just don't want your listeners to think that I have an MD, so that is enough there. More importantly, I think along with doing my subspecialism in anesthesia, the super speciality that we have is a 
fellowship in pain management, which I did from University College of London. And I've trained in Oxford area as well. And then after that, I've been now a consultant in for almost 13 years, looking after people in pain when they are admitted to hospital for surgery, when they are admitted for other medical problems with flare-ups of their other chronic pain conditions and admitted. And then in the outpatient part of my hospital that I'm working, I look after pain patients, I do injections and procedures. And then I'm also in the community looking after and supporting primary care GPs, general practitioners and, and physios with a community pain service as well. So it is about the breadth of the pain experience and to actually see patients on their journey from when they had their first episode of what we call acute pain to then where it becomes more chronic and the chronic pain and then they have their flare-ups and they get admitted back again into the community with whatever treatments they have. So it is that appreciation of the entire journey that has made me realize that actually the we keep thinking and we keep treating pain as if it is just acute pain all the time. But what we now realize is that acute pain and chronic pain are two completely separate things. Now, pain itself, the, the definition that was there, like the official definition which has been made by the organization called the International Association for Study of Pain, which is IASP, which is like the premier organization in the world for pain education, pain research, and pain science understanding. They themselves have updated their definition in 2020. After 40 years, they updated their definition. But what they also said is that, yes, pain can be a emotional and physical component or perceived in terms thereof, but there does not need to be any structural damage at all. Whereas what we end up doing in common sort of society, the moment we feel pain, we assume automatically that it is due to a structural damage. But what the definition actually makes it very clear is that it is only in described in terms thereof, but there does not need to be any structural damage. And so they actually clearly say in one of the explanations that while there is an element of subjectivity, when you have a physical injury like a fracture or a surgery or you fall, you hurt yourself or you have, let's say, rheumatoid arthritis and you have a flare up of your joints and they swell up and they become swollen and red or you have fever. Those are all the times when you have a chemicals that are released from the site of injury. That process of chemicals being released from the site of injury is a separate word altogether. That word is called nociception. When that nociception is a signal, is a chemical signal, that goes to the nerves and it travels along the nerves. It can be any nerves. It, there are no such things called as pain nerves or something, but it is just that that nerves that carry that nociceptive signal has to travel in the nerves, in the spinal cord, and it goes to the brain. The brain is the final organ that decides whether that nociceptive signal is a threat, is it a danger. It has got to compare that signal that's coming in and compare it to any other similar signal that it has already received in the past. And it makes all the split second decisions in less than a microsecond. And if it decides that, yes, this is something that I need to protect, like, you know, make the muscles go tight so that the joint doesn't move anymore, make the muscles go tight so that the blood flows, reduces from the cut and makes it easier. All of that decision making and it says, OK, I need to protect that point. It brings about the experience of what we all understand as pain. So pain and nociception are two entirely separate things, which is a very fundamental construct I explore in the book as well. And I teach all my uh, healthcare professional colleagues is that we need to appreciate that when there is nociceptive signals, you can say there is acute pain. And that acute pain will respond to medicines or surgery or injections or steroids or anti-inflammatory neurofen or paracetamol, high chance of success. But when you have the experience of pain that has become chronic more than three months, then it's an entirely separate thing altogether. And you may find that medicines and interventions like injections or surgery 
are only partially successful or do not work at all. And that is the time you need to bring other strategies to change the experience of how the brain is making the opinion. So that is the distinction between sort of pain as we understand it. There are some types as well which we can explore, but that is fundamentally how we need to look at pain, nociception, acute pain and chronic pain. Beautiful. And I think that I want to give enough time for us to talk about the holistic approaches. So if we could just have a very quick view into how does this chronic pain impact sleep and how does lack of sleep prevent you moving past pain? Um, I don't want to spend too long on that. So Deepak, I think that uh, that was a good differentiation, but what I like to spend most of our time talking about is the holistic approach, the practical aspects, but maybe if you could just give a quick introduction into the connection between pain and sleep. Obviously, we struggle to sleep if there's pain, but then if there's perpetuating lack of sleep, how is that preventing us from moving past chronic pain? Absolutely. I, I think uh, it, when I was saying what, when I ended up on the last part there, I spoke about this perception of the pain from the part of the brain, you know, how it decides whether it needs to protect or not. So based on that, what we have now realized is that we need to look at the other factors that can change the experience of how the brain is interpreting a threatening stimulus or a dangerous stimulus. What as now the research shown as far as pain is concerned is that there are a few other techniques or strategies that can alter this perception of threat. So of course, stress is one thing, you know, the neuroscience and stress part there. The diet and microbiome and understanding of dietary constructs is one thing. Sleep is another very important aspect over there. Physical activity and sedentary versus excess physical activity, both have been talked about. And then, of course, another very common, it's understood, and it is always being talked about as complementary therapies, like therapies of mind and body. But now, again, we've got the scientific understanding of saying how that can also influence the threat perception nature of the brain. So out of these kind of five extra arms broadly that have now been shown, sleep by far, I think, is the fundamental foundation. Like if, I, if you imagine a house with pillars that are over there, to me, sleep is the fundamental foundation that is there on which you have the pillars of the diet, the physical activity and sort of connection as it is social support and community. And I think if that can be there, then you can build the roof of the house, which is essentially our quality of life, our well-being. So with sleep as a foundation, why do I say that? What has now been shown is that, like you mentioned, the bi-directional nature of sleep. Often it is understood that if you're in pain, your sleep is disturbed. That people intuitively say, okay, if you're in pain, then you must be, uh, it is very natural to not get sleep. But now the studies have shown that if you have had impacted sleep, so for example, people who are night shift workers or people who are these days doing a lot of binge watching TV till late hours at night, does they compromise their going to sleep or they get up early because they've got long uh, durations of travel to get to work. When you start compromising on the hours of sleep, you are creating the situation where the nervous system is not able to finish its daily processes and housekeeping role, which is what sleep is fundamentally for. When that is not there, the nervous system actually then becomes vulnerable to perceiving various signals as more threatening. It means then that when you get a relatively mild injury or a twist or a sprain or a fall, what could have been otherwise mild in terms of the actual physical uh, muscle in the back, that pain where it would have settled in four to five days will now last for two to three months or more longer. And that is what you have discovered is a bi-directional nature where low quality of sleep and hours of sleep, both quantity and quality, can have an impact on pain intensity, experience and duration. 
And how do, how do you feel that we should be moving past um, painkillers? Is there a reason we should? Is there a way that we can? And the reason I'm asking you this, Deepak, is that there's a lot a lot of people who are quite dependent on painkillers and of course there might be a time where uh, that can help if it is obviously if it's physiological and psychological impact from the pain itself but do give us some reason for why we should be looking to move past just painkillers so First of all, Deepa, inherent in that question and, and for your listeners as well, is the challenge of painkillers. First, firstly, to me, I don't even call them painkillers. I call them just pain medication because when you say a language like painkillers, we automatically expect it will be killing pain. But we know that that is not the case. No medicine actually kills pain at all unless and until it is only acute pain wherein maybe medicines like neurofen or ibuprofen can help in the acute pain. But once you've got chronic pain, these medicines do not work effectively at all. So they're not painkillers in chronic pain at all. They are just medications to reduce a percentage of the pain, 10, 20, 30 percent at the most. Now, it is absolutely right to say that people take them because they don't have or they feel they don't have any other option. 30, 10 in the night when they want to get to bed and pain is interfering, they are taking something that feels like a quick fix. But it doesn't work and then it becomes a, almost a vicious cycle where one thing leads to another. What we have to understand, and that's where I want to really leave your listeners with that option there, is to have a look at their overall lifestyle. What are they doing in terms of saying, how can I calm what might have happened that I can change? It opens up a series of routines or things they can do that can be more effective for inducing sleep rather than depending on drugs alone. That is a necessary challenge, almost at a public health level, a discussion we have to have about how we improve sleep using a variety of natural techniques before you finally go down the drug root of it because the drugs for sleep right now you know yes pain medications are one thing to reduce pain in the hope that if pain goes down sleep might come there is obviously another group of drugs which are specifically for making you sedated and drowsy to induce sleep but by and large all the western studies have shown that those group of drugs they cause drowsiness and maybe improve sleep in the Short term. So they might be good if you are having jet lag or you want to have some acute phase. You've just come back after two nights of night shift and you just want to get your routine back. Maybe that's okay. But when you start using it regularly, it actually disturbs your sleep cycle and patterns. And there is now research coming out, unfortunately, that those drugs are also dependence inducing. And worst case, they actually increase overall risk of mortality from dying from other health conditions. So they are not at all a good choice. And I would really urge your listeners to have a deep look at what are they doing in the run-up to sleep and what can they be doing to ensure and reassure the nervous system that there is some element of safety and it doesn't need to be threatened. That is the all. Um, and I okay. just okay. wanted to say that there were so many nuances to what you spoke about the pain medication is the differentiation that, you know, sometimes in the short term, they might be. And I'm so, so I can't tell you, am I happy to hear you say that the research is showing <laughs> that there is. Uh, dependency created, there is uh, impact on the body itself. I mean, I don't want to be happy that you said that, but um, at least it's validating when you believe this all along and then there is something which just tells us that our thinking is correct. And I don't, I know we don't have too much time, Deepak, that I really want to get to that holistic approach. And if you could just take us through the other things that you 
feel are necessary to move past chronic pain and to support sleep without relying on medication? So one of the things I talk about is understanding this principle of what's called the circadian rhythm, sort of the clock that we all have, not only in our brain, but also in every cell and every organ of the body. And all of those other cells and organ clocks, they are all synchronized to this master clock, which is there in the brain. And that is where the whole rhythm of when we get up and wake up uh, is brought about. I won't go too deep into it. It's there in the book. And I think there are other podcasts that also talk about it in much more greater detail. But as far as pain is concerned, it is important that we try to bring that circadian rhythm back to some kind of synchronicity so that the brain starts to feel the first element of reassurance. And that usually is where I start to approach a lot of my patients on, is what can we do in terms of making them aware of the master clock and what are the techniques that we can do to sort of help with the master clock. And I think technology plays quite a good role in understanding that. I think the first thing with all these things, and that's the good thing about technology these days, is you have wearables that could potentially give people an idea of what their sleep quality and sleep cycles are doing and what the hours of sleep there are and where is the disturbance. The second thing I talk about is I think what is popularly called a sleep hygiene. But for me, it's almost like a sleep routine that you have to do a series of things in the run up to going to bed. So while you have something to initially monitor your sleep to say where are the gaps, the first next easy thing for people to do is to start looking at the routine that is there before their bedtime, one or two hours before bedtime. What are the ways they can do to reduce the light? the noise and the temperature. Those are three important aspects that they can pay attention to and that is often within their control to manage or change. The third important thing is the dietary aspects and movement aspects. What can they do in the run-up to again sleep in terms of diet? Simple things that I suggest again is to avoid any kind of coffee after three in the afternoon because you have about six or seven hours of time between that and sleep and alcohol in terms of again ensuring that there is a clear gap between when you have alcohol in the evening to going to bed and then the kind of food as well is to ensure that there is that what is called as a anti-inflammatory a less processed uh, sort of uh, less processed food is important because it's not going to make the immune system more inflamed because once the immune system receives inflammation and it's at nine o'clock or 9.30 in the night, then that is going to provoke the nervous system and that means the sleep gets disturbed. So late night snacking, binging on ultra processed stuff is another simple measure. So these two, three measures in terms of a sleep routine, a diet routine and a movement routine can be things that they can do in the run up to sleep, plus a wearable to actually monitor the quality and then feedback based on that wearable. I think that will be the first. Uh, probably the only caveat I'd say is wearables are still an evolving technology. So in reference to some of your listeners or patients, who might be quite anxious or who might be very focused on data and get too hung up on the data, I think we need to strike a balance between the amount of data that a wearable gives because that can be sometimes too much data and not enough sensitivity and not enough quality versus taking that measure. And that's where I think it's useful to engage with someone, with a health professional or someone who can at least guide you on that aspects there so that you don't get too bog down in the data that comes out from these wearables and help you make the right decisions in terms of the routine. Very sensitive, Deepak. And I think I've had so many clients who've told me when that they don't want wearables because it just makes them anxious when they look at it. Um, I'd just love for you to leave us with, um, is there something specifically, maybe in terms of nutrients or maybe a specific 
kind of movement which could be helpful when somebody is struggling with pain because obviously you spoke about movement but a lot of times when someone is struggling with a lot of pain it's uh, tough to get around to doing anything and I know that I have a close friend who has a lot of pain issues and um, you know if the shoulder is hurting your knee is hurting you can't go for a walk you can't use your arm to bear weight uh, is it do you have any specific suggestions for pain so on those aspects there I think uh one is, of course, we have now, I think in the UK, there are a couple of apps. And I think in India, probably in the US, there must be these versions of these apps, which is called Sleep. So in the UK, it's called Sleepio, S-L-E-E-P-I-O. And essentially, they have managed to distill what is a very evidence-based therapy for insomnia and sleeplessness. And that has shown lot of promise in terms of pain management as well so cbt for insomnia it's a form of cognitive behavioral therapy which can be done and that is quite a useful way the other movement that i think about and i think that is also called this one is yoga nidra so some forms of very gentle yoga and relaxation techniques i have suggested patients to explore and some youtube videos to check out just some simple movements with our associated with breathing walking or anything there the third is, I think, I suggest a, a slightly uh, a warm bath. So you have a movement associated with being in a warm bath routine or a shower routine. That kind of movement as well can be quite useful in terms of reducing the overall temperature. Heat can relax some of the muscles there. And that heat can also act as a bit of a massage effect there. So that can be a quasi-movement and temperature routine that is there. I've suggested patients that they can also try maybe doing a little, putting on a bit of a tense machine. So, you know, trialing a tense machine pad on the tight muscles so that they can gently add frequency that can improve the blood flow and relax the muscle so that can be a passive way to help about half an hour one hour before bedtime as a routine to do it for a 15 or 20 minute cycle in that affected muscles or tight muscles in there so these are three four options that they could consider as a way lastly there is some it's not yet done essentially for sleep and pain but there is this understanding of this technique called graded motor imagery. So sometimes the brain is so powerful in a way that if you can close your eyes and imagine you're doing a movement. So if you can visualize how you're going to be doing a particular movement and, and, and do that, then that also apparently can change the circuits and help the brain towards coming there. So often I suggest it can be a YouTube video with, with a nice screensaver or a walk that is going through nature. You look at that there and you close your eyes and pretend that you're going on that walk as you walk past there. And as the music and the birds chirping out, whatever evening time effect routine comes, you need not have moved, but your brain would feel that it is felt safe. It has moved and it will start going towards a relaxation effect on there. And that is often a simple set of things. So people with pain who are finding themselves in a situation of not being able to move, those would be a few of my suggestions. And I think you gave a lot of suggestions. I was thrilled to hear the yoga nidra. I was thrilled to hear about the visuals because I remember 20 years ago telling people who are struggling to come up into Sheer Shasana headstand to visualize coming up before they actually tried it. So I was really, in. I mean, it's always motivating, inspiring to hear recommendations such as these which are safe they're so easy to bring into our life uh, thanks a lot Deepak where can people get a hold of your book I, I believe uh, I mean it's available on Amazon in most countries I think definitely it might take a little longer to arrive in terms of uh, Amazon India I think you need to check probably on that front there but i know a few of my friends have been able to source it over there and it's available uh, but otherwise on the website and, and you know in podcasts like yours i i do a fair amount of 
a discussion around pain management techniques and I'm there on all social media channels as well. So hopefully they can find me on YouTube as uh, Dr. Deepak Ravindran. That would be the preferred option for a lot of my videos that I'm doing now on uh, there. So please subscribe to the channel and that would be a good way to get in touch with me. And then of course, I'm there on Instagram and Twitter as well as Dr. Deepak Ravindran. Thank you so much, Deepak, for giving your time today. It was great conversation with you. And I hope our listeners can take some of the tools, especially the aspects about mindset and just thinking about pain differently. So it was an absolute pleasure hosting you. Thank you. Likewise, it's good to be here and good to have this chat with you. Thank you, Deepa. If this episode resonated deeply with you and made a difference, I'd encourage you to get a copy of Deepak's book, Pain-Free Mindset. Pain, as you can see, is intertwined with the functioning of multiple systems in the body and therefore, it is only the holistic approach that can help you to break free. If you are a listener to the show and enjoy the guests that I bring, do write me an email on deepa at ohahealth.com with your thoughts for the show. Better yet, take a moment to leave a review on Apple Podcasts. It will help to keep the show going. Have a great day. This podcast is intended to provide helpful and informative material on the subject matter covered in the episodes. The podcast is not acting in the capacity of a doctor or a registered dietitian and is not rendering any professional healthcare or medical service. The information in the podcast is not intended as a substitute for medical advice or services or as treatment or cure for any particular health condition. The advice and tools contained herein may not be suitable for your situation. Any medical questions regarding contraindications and cautions or any questions of whether or not to proceed with any practices provided in the show should be referred to qualified health professionals before adopting the same. The podcast specifically disclaims any responsibility for any liability, loss, risk, personal or otherwise which may be incurred as a direct or indirect consequence of the use of information from this podcast or the application adoption of any of the information provided.